All right. Well, welcome everybody to What About Books? This is our last week on John Maxwell's Your Roadmaps for Success. Uh, tell you, this has been a, uh, in one way, a difficult book for me because I've realized there's a lot of stuff that I've, I know that I'm not, that I haven't been uh, executing on. I could, uh, I could write uh, a long summary just on that. Um, I think it's a great, great book. I mean, I think yeah, it's oh, yeah, uh, uh, I do. I've got somebody that I'm coaching right now, and I'm using this as a uh, as a partial template. And uh, so, huh? Uh, it's uh, there's just some good stuff in here. In fact, I thought about you know maybe what I need to do I need to take one thing out of each chapter and set myself a month reminder on about the twentieth of a month for each one of those to I don't know some kind of circle to circle back through somehow. Um, yeah, I don't know, maybe I need to do it. Like what was, who was it? Ben Franklin. He, when he was 19 years old, he wrote out 13 virtues and then he would every week focus on one of those virtues. So it means he went through that four times a year, um, still doing it when he died, you know, he died what in his eighties, which is pretty old. Yeah. A long time for somebody back then. Um, have you ever let me ask this this chapter 10 starts off with a statement have you ever read a book that changed your life one that revolutionized your thinking and altered how you live in a significant way beth how about you you ever read a book like that well other than the bible i have to think for a little bit um all right. I like that other than the Bible. I was, think thinking, I was thinking the same thing. Gary, how about you? <laughs> I've got a couple up here that, uh, you know, live in the extraordinary life by, by Charles Stanley. And uh, let's see, there's uh, one by Swindoll. I've got them up here. Uh, Living Above the Level of Mediocrity by Swindoll is a real strong biblically based you know, foundation, how do you live your life uh, out in the marketplace? Those two books uh, are really strong. And then uh, the newest, uh, the Machia books, the book. Mm -hmm. And uh, who's our other guy? I've got him. When, Trevor Hudson. Uh, I can tell you this, uh, Tim Keller, Every Good Endeavor is extremely real, well written too. So yeah, there, there are some that, you know, I personally outlined the uh, Swindoll book and still got a raggedy copy uh, floating around in my files. How about you, Herdy? My first uh, real book that impacted me was How to Win Friends and Influence People, Bill Carney. Mike? Get the, one we, the one we read at DMS um that was a maxwell book uh the 15 the 15 invaluable laws of growth yes yeah. yes and that was one of the first books i've ever read i didn't start reading till i met you danny <laughs> <laughs> you're there an you influence your son there you go yeah, yeah. <laughs> the at least i didn't have to uh, drag you to barnes and nobles which i did i was coaching a guy a few years ago and we were meeting uh, uh, we'd met at his office a couple of times then we started meeting at the panera bread out in the galleria and uh and i was telling him about reading this and reading that and um come find out he was having his wife read it <laughs> and then he wasn't reading and i anyway finally confessed to me that he had not and he was late 40s he had not read a book since probably uh, seventh or eighth grade Sound like me. <laughs> and and I said, uh, 
come on. Took him down to Barnes and Nobles. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just tell you, well, better not tell you his name. Uh, he's a builder here in town. And he, we got down there and I said, pick out a book. And he said, you going to buy me a book? I said, I'm buying you a book. I said, yeah, I'll add it to your bill, but you're buying a book. And <laughs> I forget now what book he picked out. And I had to tell him a week later, I said, his first name is Terry. And I said, Terry, I'm not coaching you anymore if you're not going to read because it's, it's going to do you no good. Makes sense. Yeah. And uh, he has since I saw him about three years ago. And he's reading a well. His his, his best friend is a, my dentist, and my dentist told me probably a year ago uh, that he's still reading a book a quarter. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, you know, my book. I was going to say the most current book that I've read, most recent that I keep revisiting is our next book actually switch on your brain and i've probably been through that book five six times over the past five years and uh, uh visit she has an app anyway uh, uh but other than that uh hand me another brick by Chuck Swindoll, and it's a leadership book pulling the leadership principles out of, of the book of Nehemiah. Uh, and uh, like Gary, that's a ratty copy. And I actually met Chuck Swindoll probably, I was in a class that he was teaching, a business class he was teaching about 15, 17 years ago. And I mentioned that book and he said, have you read any, how much I liked it? And he said, have you read any other books of mine? He said, I said, yeah, probably seven or eight. And this, and that, at that time he had written 80, 90 books. And he said, what's your favorite book of mine? I said, hand me another brick. And he goes, you know, I wrote, I, I wrote that book in 1975 and I've written 80 books since then. And you and my wife, uh, 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 that's your favorite. <laughs> hmm. So, um, anyway. Um, you know, interesting. I've heard. Out of mine. Yes, yes. Well, it's just, it's from long ago, but it's called The Artist, Artist Way. The what? Artist, Artist Way. Is that by Julia Cameron? Yeah. I think that's the one. Yeah. Oh, uh, that's awesome. Yeah, I referenced that book yeah. in my in my journaling um uh class. Matter of fact, I've got a, a Substack getting ready to go out. You guys are have signed up for my free Substack. I've got that uh something I'm, I'm referencing that book in, in an upcoming Substack uh the uh, uh email that's going out. That's a great book. You have to remember, I came from, my mom was a med tech and my dad was a science teacher. And yet I was into music. I was into ballet. You know, I'm not, I'm not what I would call like a true artist, but it was just a completely different way of looking at how to approach life. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah, it's a great book. And uh, uh, she's a, uh, she's a pretty special lady. Okay. Um, you know, John's story about of this Elmer Townsend, Elmer Towns. Mm -hmm. um, he's referenced that guy uh, quite a few times uh, over the over the years in in different books. Uh, obviously, a huge influence on him. Like this statement on page 207, what Elmer did for me, I have tried to pass on to others. Okay. 
Have you ever given anybody a book and then they tell you later they didn't appreciate it because you thought you were criticizing you were criticizing them? <laughs> uh, that rings a bell, but I can't think of it right off the top of my head. But but that's I, what my sisters told me. Oh really? Yeah. <laughs> what book did you give them? Oh man, it was years ago. It was a you know a Christian living type book. So. Whatever I gave them must have had some harsh words in there that struck a core. Yeah. Yeah, it's, that's a, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I gave somebody a book after, now this was a book that a pastor had recommended that when somebody dies, this is a good book. And, I don't remember who it was, but I do remember about uh, 20, probably 20 years ago, somebody dying and me, me giving them this little book. And they let me know later they didn't agree with it. No. So. Uh, and I know that uh, that the person that died, I remember the person that died was a believer. So. I was going to China one time and they have a habit of gift giving. So uh, I didn't know anything about the culture. So to speak. Uh -oh. this doesn't I, sound good. I was buying, I was going to buy some clocks, some little giveaway things. And I'd already bought them and my trip hadn't arrived yet. I told somebody I had these clocks and they said, oh, you don't take a clock to a Chinese culture because that reminds them of death. Mm. The clock is ticking. So mm -hmm. I, I had like 10 of those things around the house for a long time. Uh, here, you know, the chapter, I thought this was really, really interesting. He says, uh, one of the sub chapter headings is why many don't take anyone along. And, you know, of course, he's talking about focusing on others and, uh, you know, paying it forward. Um, you got a quote here. We exist temporarily through what we take, but we live forever through what we give. He goes on to say, uh, there are, uh, if mentoring others is such a rewarding calling, why doesn't everyone do it? One reason is that it takes work. There are others, and here are a few of the most common ones. Insecurity. Ego, inability to discern people's success seeds. I thought that was all interesting. Wrong concept of success. Lack of training. Fred Smith, I think Fred Smith was the uh, uh, FedEx guy, right? Some of us tend to think Quote, I could have been a success, but I never had the opportunity. I wasn't born into the right family, or I didn't have the, the money to go to school, unquote. But then we measure success by the extent we're using what we've received. It eliminates that frustration. I've got that highlighted here, and I had to think about it a little bit. But when we measure success by the extent we're using what we've received, it eliminates that frustration. What does anybody you think about? You really have to buy into that. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think work. about how much I've. So, so as, as I, there's, uh, Gary, what do you mean by that? Go ahead. Oh, you, you know, just say you were born in uh, not total poverty, but pretty close, and there weren't a lot of opportunities, you know, compared to uh, a more wealthy group of people. But I've seen people who are really living on the skinny uh, adults with children and their children were profoundly affected because they were in a relatively affluent church. Uh, it's, it's, well, I think this, if, I, I, I think challenge. this what he, well, I think that, I'm sorry, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. It would be a real challenge, especially for uh, an immature adolescence because they're seeing kids that have stuff and get to do things that. Well, I think that's what he's saying things. is that, Okay, I'm going to say it again. When we measure success by the extent we're using what we've received, so if we if if from if somebody that's 
um, poor, but they don't waller in being poor and they rise to, to another level, not necessarily, let's say money, but just from a, from a learning standpoint, then it eliminates the frustration of, of um, being, not being born into the right family. And all I'm saying is that uh, you have to buy into that 100% for it to work. You, you can't, yeah. You can't straddle the fence on that philosophy. Yeah. And so, uh, so John goes on to say, and one of the most vital aspects of how we're using what we receive comes in the area of helping others. So a complimentary list of that starts on page 210. And he's got, uh, let me flip the page here, but he's got one, two, three, uh, four bullet points. Uh, that kind of complement that. You know, everybody wants to feel worthwhile. Everybody needs and responds to encouragement. People are naturally motivated and people buy into the person before they buy into their leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, great list. And it's complementary to that from a life philosophy standpoint. Uh, and his header is uh, what you need to know uh, as you get started. But, but but today's culture is teaching the opposite of this John Maxwell book and our the generation sure. coming up, right? Is that that you should strive uh, to make everybody equal uh, with all the same assets, money, you know, the pass down stuff, uh, which makes it difficult for somebody to learn the skills to get out of uh, to go beyond what they're stuck in, right? I mean, um to me that's the fall that's the fall of society is when there is no escape because you're being taught that you just need to be the equality uh, of where i'm at needs to be the same as the guy down the street that's craziness that's just absolute insanity swindoll makes multiple points in his earlier books that if you're handed stuff free then that entitlement mentality is uh, is a killer yeah yeah they call it uh there and it may not be swindoll uh but they called it uh, uh psychic dependence which makes it sound you know la la land but just think mental dependence on the system or blaming the system uh for your circumstances and and, and i and you know, in the Bible, it says that, uh, you know, you can only be in, in my opinion, you can only be in a good mood to us. Uh, you can only go so high with a good mood. But the root of bitterness, uh, according to the Bible, can can always get worse and worse, depending on where you go with it. So if you become an entitled person, uh, you're going to develop a root of bitterness, right? And once that thing digs into the ground and gets deeper and deeper, there's no, you're right, Gary, there's absolutely no way out of that uh, unless you just have some life-changing event because um, it, 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 and that's why people are so frustrated. I think the generation coming up, these, these mm -hmm. Gen Xs and uh, whatever you want to call them, millennials, uh, you know, some of them are extremely sharp and, and really are going out there and going after it. But I'd say a majority of them, the, even the younger ones are being taught today that, you know, you're entitled. You get it. You're entitled to everything it's in handed to you. And and I mean, look at these poor. I'm, I'm getting off on a soapbox, so I apologize. But look at the people coming into the country. They're handed more than some Americans. Own. They're handed more than some veterans are getting treatment for. And that kills a society, you know. I'd like to go back and read how the Roman Empire, I need to go back and re read how the Roman Empire fell because I bet you there's some huge parallels. Yeah. It's really oh, sad. 
Well, there is, there is. And yeah. uh, oh, sorry about that. I didn't mean to go down the dirt road. Uh, uh, there's a, I forget the author right now, but there's some uh, historical fiction around the Romans and what was going on. And uh, um, I almost said the name of the book that I listened to, I think it was early last year. If you go to my book blog, you uh, we could probably go there, but it's exactly what it was. And well, uh, and I was going to say, Danny, even the British Empire, which was the last big dynasty, the seventh dynasty, right? Uh, it got got tangled up in itself. So it's just proof that you get to a tipping point, and you don't handle you don't handle it. You know, we're what the eighth dynasty, so we're we're kind of at that crossroads. Well, we're at the, I mean, this is called, there's some people that do call this, Franklin said it, uh, I mean, this American experiment or this United, this, this experiment of this, this republic, republic, this republic, <laughs> this, uh, if you can if, keep it, if you can keep it <laughs> right. and, uh, Eric Metaxas, uh, in his book, I think that's the name of it. Uh, he used that name. He, he talks about it in there, but the. You know what we've got going on that well we want all of these uh, people coming in to do the menial the menial labor like uh, it's not menial it's good labor to begin with but the it was the Greeks you know go back and study uh, you know Greek history you know Greeks anything that you had to do with your hands was was be was uh, below them. Yeah, we did get off on another another road. So I'm uh, I'm sorry. I was just saying it goes back to your lifting lid thing for us individually. You know, yeah. if well, well, back to Gary's thing, Gary. I think you were describing socialism, is as, as, right? I would say that the rabbit trails are a direct consequential, you know, cultural yeah. uh, things from these attitudes of I'm entitled. Yep, and I don't have to work. Are you know, like the Greeks, they were uh, uh, egalitarians. I think that's the word. In other words, it's a structured society, and I'm inherently smarter than you, and so I deserve more from you, and I get the best jobs, and, you know, I don't have to physically do manual labor, all, all this kind of good stuff. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's different. But, you know, what I'm seeing is I, I ask some service-level people, uh, if they don't know, uh, they just shrug their shoulders and say, I don't know. That's the mm -hmm. end of it. I haven't learned. I'm not going to tell you. I don't know. You should be satisfied with my I don't know answer. Yeah. yeah it's uh... So how to take others for a life-changing ride? And, you know, he's ending this book your roadmap for success and talking about sharing with others, mentoring others. Um, uh, and one of the things that we don't have these days very often, Mike, how about in your business and manufacturing is the word apprentice used at all? Not at all. We wouldn't be subject matter experts. There's no apprentice. <laughs> but um, you've got to be a you've got to be a, a, an apprentice to a subject matter expert before you. Can become, I guess uh, unless you're faking it until you make it, uh, right? Now that that's here at the manufacturing facility. At the other place, uh, you can get a, a machinist apprentice at an entry level. Yeah, yeah. But, okay, but what about because it's a trade? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. What about a uh, uh, in welders? Hey Matt, do we have welding apprentices or no? Yeah, he said there's something we could look into. I just no, talked to the operations manager. Yeah, or we were looking into. Yeah. Well, at, at DMS we have the welding um, welding uh, uh, program. DMS University. Do you remember? Yeah. We teach people how to weld. Yeah. That was kind of apprentice, but right now the way the current market is and, and you know manufacturing and stuff. It's just the stronger surviving. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll ask Rob about that. By the way, did we talk? Did I ask you about this? Rob is, uh, is, 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 is the, is just about three weeks ago was appointed by Governor Abbott to the uh, Board of Regents for Texas State Technical College. 
Did you oh, hear about awesome. that? No, I yeah. didn't. That's yeah. Good. Yeah. That's a pretty big deal. It is. Yeah. yeah. And they're just a lot. He wants to do a course in this region, especially. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, apprentice. And, and that's one of the things so that. The, yeah. oh, I would say the, the, the buzzword or the key phrase now in managerial leadership is a uh, a co-sharing of responsibilities is the tech, uh, diplomatic way to say that you bring somebody in on your team and let them use their capabilities and resources to, to share uh, and learn and contribute. And that's supposed to boost their morale and the productivity of the company and things of that nature. Mm. So you don't label someone, you let them participate in decisions. Uh, so nothing inherently bad about that uh, if they've got a skill or a gift that they can truly contribute. I would, imagine, say, I would imagine in very sophisticated, complicated situations, you would have to have apprenticeship. Like I'm sitting here thinking of, a guy getting introduced to working on a, a oil rig, right? You would bet that he would go through quite a bit of apprenticeship before he's allowed to start grabbing stuff that could kill him, right? Uh, so I imagine you'd see that kind of level at some, and uh, in, in, even in the manufacturing on a machine shop like Mike runs, I think you would see, is it training or internship? Is it the same thing? Mm, it's a it's to be on OJT, right? That's what you would think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's probably yeah. that label apprentice uh, that we haven't seen in in you know, quite some time. Uh, of you know, we think about Christ and discipleship today. You know, these days it would be difficult, and we see discipleship programs, but they're not really just. I mean, you know you know matthew and you know peter and andrew and john and james and the others they live with jesus for three years that's a disciple an apprentice doesn't live and that's you know, anyway i could go down a path on that but uh beth were you going to say something he's on a phone call yeah okay she switched she switched to her ipad she's on a phone call she yeah. said in chat okay uh, so, so here he, he he gives us beginning on two twelve, how to take others for a life changing ride. One, make people development your your top priority. Two, limit who you're taking along. We'll come back to that one. De three, develop relationships before starting out. Four, give help unconditionally. Five, let them fly with you for a while. I think that's it. Oh, six, put fuel in their tank. Tapes, books, you know, you just share, share, share. Uh, seven, stay with them until they can solo successfully. Eight, clear the flight path. Nine, help them repeat the process. That was it. Nine. Uh, Back to the limit who you take along. Like it or not, you can't take everyone along with you. If you take too many people along, you will never get off the ground. Besides, your time is limited. He says here, you should spend 80% of your time developing only the top 20% of the people around you. The question is, is picking those, the top, what the top 20% are. I don't believe he's talking about org chart. So a resource for you guys, I'm taking a biblical leadership class again. And uh, so spiritual leadership by J. Oswald Sanders is uh, real short chapters and kind of an acknowledged textbook, if you will. Uh, so if you're digging into that, uh, that might be one you want to pick up and add to your library. 
So it's like honorable ambition, search for leaders, natural and spiritual leadership. Can you become a leader? Uh, all with a real core uh, Christian worldview background. Yeah, very leadable, uh, readable, not in the stratosphere with super long technological or uh, religious terminology. What was the name of the person again, Gary? J. Oswald Sanders. Thank you. He's dead. Uh, they have upgraded the book. I think he wrote it in the 20s or 30s. Super. And they've upgraded it to be more 21st century uh, relatable. Okay. Thank you. So, Danny, I would say that my the mission of my business has, has been uh, oriented at that uh, giver role, right, that we read from Adam Grant's first book on Give Take. And mm -hmm. um, and I would say that one of the joys I get is when I see people's light bulbs go off, whether they hire me or not, like what I did with you guys last week training on YouTube. I had a lot of people, you know, light bulbs going off and it makes you feel good that you're giving people direction, whether they decide to follow up or not. You gave them some stuff to go back and think about, you know, and you never know where that seed you you put in the ground leads to. Uh, but you did your half. You did your accountability is what I'm trying to say. You did mm -hmm. you did what was expected and you gave it your best shot. You you were prepared. You know, you, you gave them everything you had. Right. Uh, so I, I, I guess that would be an example of. Of them. Uh, and since I don't coach individuals, you know, but I'm, but you're always giving people you're always talking to people. Right. You're always giving them something to think about. Mm. so I don't know maybe yeah. that's not a good example but but it's what I do in my business yeah no uh, it is it is and uh, uh, when you think about you're thinking about questions people are asking yeah yeah You know, even you asked a question earlier about the books, selling in a crisis was really helpful for me as well, because kind of that's where we're at right now. I'm sorry, which book? To go back of the book, Selling, selling in a crisis. crisis, that we went over, that really yeah. helped me a lot, too. Yeah. It actually opened my eyes to a lot of things I was doing that was wrong as well. Yeah. Yeah. But well, next week, um, and, and I'll send a list. I've got to go through the list uh, uh, to be sure I got them on there. But uh, uh Next week, would like to spend this time going through all the books that we've gone through in the last, you know, you know what, 15, 16 months. And uh, uh, so. So I'm going to lost I shut my app down there uh, here. I got it back. Danny, while you're looking for that, one thing we you haven't discussed in this book is we've assumed, you know, uh, how to be successful. And a lot of us are in places where I guess we're considered leadership. And I wanted to ask you that. Do you think leadership is a learned skill or something we're born with? No, it's learned. Right. Yeah, it's learned. Um, hey, Herdy, when I was going to graduate school, one of my uh, HR type profs uh, basically said it's a learned skill. The only thing he had observed, and he'd been HR director at IBM here in Austin for quite some time. He said, he said the only thing he didn't think you could quite train somebody is how they're going to react during a true crisis. You know, something immediate, pressing, you know, you're in war, the enemy's coming at you. Uh, you do, you know, yeah. You're gonna wet your pants and jump in the foxhole, or <laughs> or organize a group of guys and shoot back. Yeah, right. Well, right. that's where the on uh, the on the job on the job training, the trial by fire, and uh, the uh, evaluation, correction, rinse and repeat come in. Mm -hmm. And 
where I think most companies hire a firefighter that when there's a crisis, the many times, not, or let me say sometimes, the, the manager over a department or over a branch or something, when there's a crisis, there's somebody else that comes in, handles a crisis, and then steps out. Uh, because mm -hmm. that person that could handle that crisis real well probably will create, many of them will create a crisis so they can put the fire out. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, uh, whereas they, uh, in a way, that's a, and I know that that can be pretty argumentative. It's the ideal person can do both. But I think we can have, I've seen some really good managers, but all of a sudden there's a crisis and uh, they don't handle it as well because you have to think differently in a crisis. Manager is going to spend maybe too much time trying to figure out how the crisis happened when, when during the crisis you need to fix the crisis, not figure out how to keep it from happening again that can be done after the fact you know if you're talking about that specialist and i've seen it before because i've worked with other consultants over the last 10 or 12 years they have an inherent interest in maintaining their business and so they're going to be uh extra inquisitive about what's going on they want to see results and they want to contribute to the point where they keep getting that check uh, and they're engaged. So th there's definitely uh, a strong bias when you get a specialist like that uh, because, you know, they're motivated to continue an income stream and an ego ride. This might fit into, well, just a second, I did something. John gives a a little short spreadsheet that here at the end of the book, what should we do along the way? One, identifying development areas, and two, making the, oh, we got three things. Two, making the development of people part of your routine, and then three, planning monthly. Um, what page is that on, Dan? Uh, that is on page 223. Okay. And then the afterwards, uh, the afterward. What did you like best about the trip? And this is, uh, you, know, you know, doing a good evaluation and correction. Here's a statement that I know some people have. I've had a couple of arguments about this statement on page 225. If you continue to be growth oriented rather than goal oriented, you'll stay on the path of success and people may even give you more credit than you deserve. But no matter what happens, keep following your roadmap, moving forward on the journey staying true to your new definition of success. As you go, make sure you take others with you. But the first part of that, if you continue to, to be growth oriented rather than goal oriented, I mean, that's what, he, that's everything about John is that in the book, the 15 valuable uh, laws of growth that you mentioned, Mike, uh, mm -hmm. you know, he emphasizes that to no end. And um, you know, my whole uh, uh, you know, well, I, I go back to Zig Ziglar, and when he, when he said plans are in um, or goals are in concrete, plans are in sand. This is what he was, I think, alluding to there, where you build yourself out in front of your business, 
yes, you have you have a vision. You set goals that lead you towards that vision, but then you put plans in place. And the plan is is the tasks that need to be executed, and and the timelines in which they need to be executed. But the time is part of the plan, not the goal. Uh, and this that 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 statement of John's there in the book. If you continue to be growth oriented rather than goal oriented, you'll stay on the path to success. Um, so, and I know that's pretty argumentative. And uh, I, I would, you know, personally, right now, I'd say I'm doing <clears> some <throat> of both by working on a doctorate. I'm I'm growing. I'm learning information. I'm digging pretty deep. It's forced, and but the plan, if I can do it, it's going to be a big stretch. Is to have that diploma in three years and then where that leads me either consulting teaching something like that uh, hopefully it matches up with my gifts test which is more of a teacher trainer uh, but I would love to consult as well I just don't want to get on an airplane every week and yeah. go somewhere well so, I mean yeah yeah it, it, I mean Gary I'm sorry Hardy go ahead well uh, yeah I'll finish this no jump into his point he just made then I'll follow up with mine um, I mean, Gary, you're, you have a vision of what you want to be doing and you, part of that, it, it, in order to achieve that, uh, you've got the PhD, uh, that you want to right. obtain. So your plan is to achieve it in three years, but if something happened and you, that kept you from achieving it in three years you would just redivide the plan and keep the goal out there you wouldn't uh in, in other words you don't have to reset a goal the goal's there yeah, to get to get true. the phd uh, the, the phd and you've got like seven or eight years to get the thing you know so they're not yeah. hanging a sword over your head it's self-imposed yeah yeah just like me and my marathon it was uh for you know the 20th of last year february 20th of last year um uh got covid and uh, you know of the right there at the end didn't make it tried it didn't make it had it for next weekend new plan um you know got blown up uh in a way the plan did so now the plan the goal is still out there to run a mar uh, run a marathon my first marathon so now it's april 29th is oh, the cool. plan yeah so go ahead Hurry. Uh, it's a trail marathon at uh, Reveille Ranch, which is a um, up on the west, the east side of Lake Buchanan. Uh, okay. there, there's there's a uh, bike uh, and and trail running uh, a place up there. Um, so if I if I draw that out like an equation, I would put growth greater than goals, goals greater than no plan. Oh, that's cool. Right. Because, because, yeah. because I think he's almost writing this in the book to, to, to get you to think, but I can't see, I can't see one without the other. Right. If you, if you don't have growth, you're not going to have goals. And if you don't set goals, you're probably not going to grow. So to me, but I do think the growth is a little bit greater than the goals. And I do think the goals are greater than no plans. So, I mean, that's how I would formulate the picture in my brain. If I was forming it, something. Yeah, I mean, the, go goals, it, the, the goal stays, it, it, the plan will come out of a goal. Um, you know, I go to Napoleon Hill uh, and the Think and Grow Rich. Uh, there's The goal is a desire, and which I think is the secret that he was referring to there in the book they never tells you the answer to but uh um you i mean my desire is to run a marathon and there 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 have been some time the last three or four months that i've kind of kind of ticked me off that i have that desire that goal okay <laughs> and I'd, I'd be ticked off about that one too and and uh, but uh you know i've got right now i'm i may be starting you know what 75 hard is anyway look up 75 hard it's uh it's an exercise program for 70 it's it's a life exercise thing for 75 days i may be starting it tomorrow i'm i'm trying to talk myself out of it so 
<laughs> the other life is great. In yeah. that in that scenario, is life is greater than death. Okay, just so you know. <laughs> well, one of the things that's floating around there in the motivation uh, theories and professor pace papers and things of that nature is uh, your curiosity is a motivator. So, you know, you could say, well, I'm curious if I can run a marathon or I'm really curious if I can subject myself to this discipline and get a degree or, you know, I heard he gets these Google certificates all the time. So <laughs> yeah, like, I used to. Not are you so inquisitive, Hardy? Are you really <laughs> like, uh, I want to, not that you want to do it, but you're just so interested in the material. It Listen, motivates you on. Yeah, so, so I quit taking those tests a couple of years ago. So I learned that clients don't ask the same questions that Google wants me to learn. So the way I reversed that was when clients start asking me questions about Google, I just started doing deep research on the question until I found the answer that satisfied it, whether it was from Google or. So Microsoft. you started Googling their question. Well, I, yeah, but well, other things too. But my, my point, my point being is that you're right. Curiosity. I have notebooks full of answers to questions that I've physically not only looked up the research, I put them in a Google Drive in a folder, and I can still go back and refer to those things cool. because every time I get a question, I write, I, I research it and save those documents in a folder on Google Drive. And, that, and that's how I learn. And I feel like I'm pretty deep learner on stuff simply because that's the way I do it. Hey, did you guys know there's a app out there called Google Scholar? And you yes. can put in a, a topic. And it'll pull up papers for you. Yeah. So, so Gary, uh, go to you.com right now. It's great. It's an AI. It's an AI based search engine. It writes blogs. It writes papers. It writes okay. social posting. Okay. But it's a search engine. And anytime you type in a type in a topic of research, it will bring up everything on the web in one place. Cool. Okay. Everything it, you love it for your for your research, and you'll get some you'll get some good in depth information from that. But you're right, that AI stuff is. I don't want to get off subject, but the AI stuff is can be evil or good, but it's good for that extent. Yes, sir. Write the whole so paper. As, Write as the whole part, paper. <laughs> as part of being a student, I have a massive set of libraries that I have access to. And uh, they give you uh, peer-reviewed research articles, which is oh, cool. uh, a big criteria for the profs, as they yep. want a peer-reviewed journal article for you to reference. Yep. Well, guys, let's wrap it up. Uh, Beth, any words of wisdom? Can you can you talk? There we go. She's I'm making, unmuted. Woohoo! She's making well, money. <laughs> yeah, if only. Um, my words of wisdom was something that I was doing this Baylor has a sales professional major now, yeah, and I went I up to learn a little bit more about it. And one of the things that the professor said is she said, if you're reading books only, you're going to be way behind. So I'm, I'm kind of just echoing what Gary's saying about the peer reviewed papers. She said to keep up with the latest in what's happening in the world of, you know, sales you know, the next, the next step, you have to be reading the journals. And that I, uh, I don't have access like Gary, I wish I did. But um, that's been kind of preying on my mind that I need to be in the literature just a little bit more leading edge on some of this. What does she say about, I don't know if you have a chance to ask her this, but what does she say about podcast? You know, I, I she, Obviously, she's an a in academia, right? So she didn't say anything on podcasts. But, you know, I think a podcast that would be taking things from the current literature before they've gotten out in the mainstream, accepted in, in the books that everybody's reading, would probably be super helpful. Yeah, I, I follow for, for health and fitness and especially, uh, in a way, uh, it's, uh, there's a... You, I think he's a USC tenured professor in neuroscience named Dr. Huberman. 
so he's on podcast talking about what he's uh, learning and he's they, he's pulling out of journals and uh, uh, papers that have been published and he's uh, some of it's so far over my head but there's there's three different guys like that 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 I follow um, and uh, that are uh, college professors and, and you know uh, before we get off uh, Hillsdale college is an example of how a lot of this trend now is going toward giving people the ability to take courses, short yeah. courses to educate themselves and donate back to the cause uh, to, to keep that online. So they wouldn't be getting a doctor's like Gary, right. But for basic knowledge on basic subjects, it's good stuff. Right. So yeah, I think they're putting the, out, keeps pretty, the brain, keeps, keeps the brain going. They're putting out some pretty deep stuff. They're, for, they're putting out some pretty, pretty stuff, pretty quick. Yeah, uh, yeah uh, they've, uh, they've got a mission. Yeah. Well, hey, guys, we're we're going to finish up. Uh, Herdy, I will get you the link to this weekend last week. Um, thought I did, but obviously I didn't. And I don't doubt that I, I, I'm not doubting you at all. And I'm doubting my sanity sometimes. Uh, so get that out to you. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you good to, see, good to see you all and next week uh, I'll send an email out about the list of books and just be thinking about what you've learned and, and let's share some of that and um, uh, kind of do a checkup from the from the neck up if you will uh, I think it was you Herdy uh, I remember a few minutes ago that mentioned about I, I think it was putting into play things that there's things in these some of these books that we hadn't put into play. And I could talk into into the whole conscious, subconscious comfort zone around that. Uh, I really believe also that the next book, Switch On Your Brain, uh, will give you give us some insights into why we do when we do and why we don't when we don't do things that we know we should do. So all right everybody. See ya. Bye -bye. Thanks, Danny. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.